So we're now webcasting. Welcome to this public meeting of the Transport for the North Board. Um, if you would like to contribute to the meeting as a member of the board, please remember that the easiest way, the best way, is to use the chat function on your toolbar. just depends on your configuration, but for most of us with Microsoft Teams, it's in the middle of the screen. And on the chat function, you can say that you have a point to raise. Um, obviously, there are other ways to do it. Wave your hand at me. Um, go visual. Wave your hand at me. But register to speak on the chat bar is probably the best way. Uh, my colleague, James Lyon, from the TFN team, will keep a running list of who wants to speak, and I will ask him to update me. It's easier than me trying to use the chat bar when I'm... Um, choreographing so many things at the same time. Uh, I'll obviously use my discretion on the list that James gives me simply in order to bring in as many members as possible and to maintain a balance of contribution. I think we do well with Microsoft Teams, but there are always reception, bandwidth and static issues. So I think the protocol for these meetings is if you could keep your mic um, muted when you are not contributing, it is likely to help other people's reception. But remember, when you want to speak, you do have to unmic, and that's something I occasionally forget. Clearly, it's not the easiest way to have a formal board meeting virtually, however necessary it is in the public interest. Uh, and I, I just thought I would identify where I think the major items for discussion are today. I'm proposing that we spend a significant slug of time on the operational rail update, and Barry and I have invest, invited some guests just to make brief contributions to that item. Clearly, this is a matter primarily for the board's rail committee, but given there are so many issues about the continuing provision of rail services during COVID-19 and the restoration of services and our ensuring that the new arrangements on the OLR for Northern are working well, we think it's important that the board has assurance on this item. So it's not a decision-making item, but it is an assurance item. And then in the public meeting, I want to spend just a few minutes on item six, which is the road investment item, because there's some important good news for the north of England in recent decisions about the A66 and the A63 in Hull. And um, the challenge is making sure that we're genuinely multimodal. Uh, and then, of course, we're going to propose that one item, the investment item, item 12, is taken privately because of its confidentiality. If that's agreed, we would spend a few minutes on that at the close of the meeting. So that's the balance of the agenda as we thought we would take it today. Uh, I've obviously been given a list of who's expected to join the call and apologies and I'm going to take those as read, if that's acceptable to you. And I'm now going to come, therefore, to item two, which is declarations of interest, and just give any member of the board an opportunity to declare anything that they feel is relevant. I'll take silence for no business on that. Thank you very much. That brings me to item three. Um, Gosh, three months ago, we had our last physical meeting at Manchester Airport on the 12th of March. In fact, it was the last physical board meeting of any of the organisations I'm involved with that I've had since. A sign of very strange times. Um, so it's the first opportunity we've had to agree the minutes of the 12th of March and indeed just the minutes as well of the 29th of April, which was an informal board meeting by Zoom when we had John Armit with us, if you recall. So first of all, I'll take silence, I'll, I'll give a pause to take silence for assent. Are colleagues happy with the minutes of the 12th of March? John, it's, it's Andy Burnham here. Um, uh, forgive me if I've misunderstood, John. Is the um, NPR update deferred today or, or are we taking item seven? We're taking item seven, Andy. It won't be presented, but there'll be an opportunity for you and any other member to comment. I'll, I'll raise my issues there then, John, rather than... Thank you so much. We'll make sure you do. 
Okay, then the minutes of the 12th of March are agreed, and similarly I'll take silence for assent after a brief pause. Are colleagues comfortable with the minutes of the 29th of April informal meeting? Mm. Oh, thank, you. Not, yeah. thank you very much, colleagues. Thank you. We then come to item four, where we said we spend a little bit of time. Um, I just need colleagues to bear with me, um, because I'm going to invite four guests to the board to make brief opening presentations to us, uh, and then we'll have a conversation in the round. I'll explain why this item has been brought forward from the Rail Committee. The four guests I'm going to invite, just to give us a viewpoint, First of all, I'm going to ask Anna-Jane Hunter from Network Rail to say something on behalf of our Northern Rail partners. I'm then going to ask Beth Farhart, the Regional Secretary of the Northern TUC region, to say something on behalf of trade unions. I'm then going to ask David Sidebottom, known to many of you from Transport Focus, to say something on behalf of passengers in the north of England. And then finally, I'm going to give the floor to Richard George, chairman, of course, of the OLR company, because it's very much the end of the 100-day plan that Northern brought to this board and to the uh, Rail Committee. I think it's just important we mark that 100 days, almost in parallel to COVID resilience and preparedness, because Northern's future is very important to us. Now, we brought those guests so that we can have a rounded input in judging and assuring ourselves as a board whether uh, things are adequately being dealt with. We also have on the call, I believe, Liz Collins and Louise Ebbs from TransPennine, and they'll be available to answer any questions related to TransPennine. I would just ask our guests to be succinct, please. You'll appreciate we have a lot of business to get through with a large number of members of the board, civic and business leaders wanting to contribute. So if I just get a brief input, please, from Anna-Jane Hunter. Over to Anna Jane. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we have um, shared some slides with you in advance. Um, John, I don't know if they've gone out or if you'd like me to try and share my screen. There are only four slides, so we can do it without if it's easier. So I don't think they were circulated, so please share them if you would wish, Anna Jane, but if you could keep it, keep it tight. Yes, indeed. Um, I will try and do that very quickly um, and as I say there are only four of them if you could let me know when you can if and when you can see them I know the technology on these things is uh, not always the, the slickest I can see them Anna Jane fantastic okay so um, we really just wanted to in addition to the paper which um, which I've seen uh, produced by um, Salim at TFN which I think is a good summary of where we've where we've been and where we are during the COVID crisis. So I'm grateful to, to the contribution uh, there from TFN colleagues. And we just wanted to, to highlight um, what, we've, what we've been doing and, and, and give the opportunity for you to, to, to hear from us. So from the Network Rail perspective, really this has all been about collaborative working with our, with our colleagues, both in the operators, in the trade unions, and, and with our own uh, colleagues in Network Rail, really to... Um, deliver our priorities of keeping the railway open for key workers and for st strategic freight flows. We've successfully done that um, really across the region with a very small number um, of areas which have had um, an extremely reduced passenger service um, based on resources. And we've managed to keep freight flowing at this at this really important time, um, you know, for the country. Um, a lot of focus on major stations obviously in the in the passenger facing realm of what we do so over the past week or two you'll have seen if you if you have had reason to pass through places like Manchester Piccadilly and Leeds we now have extensive signage um, and social distancing support and measures in place um, along with enhanced cleaning of public areas um, and, and and the like we're moving into obviously mandatory face mask territory in the in the coming days so our staff have been wearing um, face coverings um, in order to sort of lead by example, which we think is really important. Um, and we will have vending machines for face masks available in, in the coming days. Um, so, so you will, again, see that moving out. And the other thing that's key to highlight from a network rail perspective is we've managed to maintain our maintenance bank for essential 
uh, maintenance delivery and enhancements over some really key weekends for us. So we, we've seen Easter and May bank holidays, obviously, during the period of time we've been in, in lockdown and significant amounts of really important work have managed to be delivered. And that's thanks to really our supply chain and our colleagues finding some fairly innovative ways of working in spite of social distancing. So that's been a real success. And there'll be some lessons that we can actually take forward from that into future scenarios. Um, and finally, just a, a point on we've managed to even bring forward some work where possible. So, um, you know, if we've had things like a parton on the on the Cumbrian um lines that needed essential works we've actually had increased access to the line that we wouldn't have been afforded if we'd been running um the normal service um we do have colleagues from my operating colleagues um on the call but i'll just scoot over from the tox point of view obviously our our objectives are aligned in terms of keeping key workers moving and we've moved through two versions two two main iterations of the key worker timetable one in march and then we we uplifted slightly in may um, and both both Northern and TP have responded well and worked with us on that as an industry. There's been some exceptionally good collaborative working to make that happen. And also with stakeholders through the contingency working group, both operators have been able to take on board feedback from um, members of the TFN community to, to really respond to local needs wherever possible, including support and getting key workers to the Nightingale hospitals and other key um, locations like that. We do now have the social distancing measures on board um, trains and, and there's been a lot of collaborative working through RDG to make sure that that's done um, as, as clearly and consistently as possible. And that flows through to the communications that customers see everywhere as well through social media, through websites and, and buy before you travel advice and the like. Um, so looking ahead, the next uplift that we're really focused on now is for the 6th of July with We'll see a further uplift in services, um, resource led and, and obviously trying to support peak capacity flows into the major conurbations. And again, that's really been coordinated through this North of England contingency group, which has been a real success. Um, it would be remiss of me to not point out that there's some challenges, of course, with delivering the social distancing measures whilst also trying to keep people moving. Capacity is significantly reduced um, and that also provides some issues for our colleagues in terms of maintaining um, driver training with having uh, only one person allowed in the cab of a train at the moment. I'll invite my colleagues from the talks to answer any specific questions about that. That really is um, really their, ex their area of expertise, but it's, it's just a nod to it in terms of overview. Um, as I say, colleagues are, are on the call to answer any specific questions. I'll leave it there in, in light of we, we, we are tight for time, but hopefully that just gives some context and adds a little bit of colour to the paper that members have already seen. John, I'll hand back to you now. Thank you, Anna Jane. Uh, your succinctness, much appreciated. You set a good example for colleagues and for all of us. Um, Thank you. And I now welcome to, to this uh, session Beth Farhat from the TUC. And Beth, would you like to give a perspective from the TUC on how you think things are going and any issues you wish the board to be aware of. Yeah, no problem. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm the Regional Secretary for the Northern TUC. Very pleased to be uh, joining the Partnership Board. Uh, I was also asked to say a few words about who we are uh, to benefit some, some colleagues on the board. So, of course, the TUC has been around for over 150 years. Um, and I guess the TUC and the, the unions we represent have been the voice of working people on a range of issues um, over the years, economic issues, but issues specific to the workplace. Uh, we are the umbrella organisation for around 50 trade unions with a collective membership of 5.9 million and currently growing uh, with 91,000 uh, new members in the last year. And of course, there's a high density of membership within the transport sector. So that makes us the largest voluntary organisation uh, in the United Kingdom um, and we help to shape uh, and influence economic policy locally, regionally and nationally. Um, and it's clear that these are very difficult times for working people right across the economy and the TUC's focus during COVID, uh, rightly so, has been on protecting jobs and pay uh, and, and, and safety has been at the heart of everything we have been trying to do in terms of getting people back to work. Um, we've been instrumental in the creation of the job retention scheme um, and obviously pushing for more regulation and enforcement on health and safety. So I could say a lot more about the economy and the world of work, but I'm here, of course, to talk about transport uh, and I'll 
start by saying that while we have seen a massive increase in passenger footfall, the expectation is that, you know, during the second half of June, July, uh, where unions and network rail are starting to talk about increasing um, network services, I think it's going to be, you know, really important that we prioritise things like uh, longer trains, especially in peak hours, because we know that the intelligence has shown that people are still traveling and commuting during these periods. Um, on passenger numbers, it's critical that there is, um, I guess, a, an intelligence system of monitoring and managing passenger footfall. And I guess that the, the, the data can be as live as possible um, so that trade unions and unions and service providers um, can agree what actions uh, need to be taken to make sure if passenger footfall reaches levels, for example, that social distancing and safe working is going to become a challenge, you know, what mechanisms can be put in, tra- in place to challenge that or change that? And there's three things I want to talk to you about quickly. Social distancing, masks, and of course, volunteering. So, you know, we are all for government guidance around maintaining the two metre separation. Of course, all employees have uh, a key role in facilitating and acting as ambassadors for social distancing principles. Um, again, with a responsibility on the employer and uh, operators to make sure that There's the relevant information, advice, signage, posters, announcements, control measures put in place to make sure that the safe flow of passengers and and, and workers are kept safe. I think there's questions, though, around um, how this will be maintained in, uh, you know, where, where there are unstaffed stations, for example. Just on face masks quickly, um, we welcome the principle. Obviously, people will feel safer to commute and workers will, will feel safer if we have face coverings. Um, there is some concern and confusion, though, around, um, uh, you know, these arrangements and how they will apply. So some questions, I guess, for colleagues to think about um, in terms of passenger compliance and enforcement, who will be responsible for making sure that protections are in place for, you know, passengers and staff, Will there be extra British transport police or security staff uh, recruited? Um, we're not clear exactly which groups are exempt from the new regulations and how staff will be ex- uh, expected to distinguish between genuine cases. So, for example, those passengers who have genuine respiratory problems, um, you know, who are the ones that are genuine and who are the ones that just don't want to wear a mask? Um, so there's a lot of questions, I guess, that, that, um, that around monitoring that, working with unions and the transport sector need to kind of have some discussions around how they're going to bring in necessary guidance to manage these arrangements. And finally, I just want to touch on volunteering. So we understand that the contract between the DFT and the volunteering charity volunteering matters is to recruit unspecified numbers of volunteers to perform roles in railway stations. I mean, this hasn't been discussed with unions, and I'm keen to stress that actually the needs, there is a need for agreement here and an open discussion on the issue. Um, I think these, these roles are going to be called transport guard angels. Um, there is some anxiety around if these roles are going to be I don't know, providing safety critical tasks or roles, which could include tasks like supporting passenger flow, access and egress out of stations and guiding passengers through new designated socially safe pathways and managing congestion um, through busier hubs. And I think, you know, real unions, are, you know, oppose the use of unpaid volunteers. And there's a school of thought around there is a large number of healthy and well staff who've been stood down that could perhaps have a conversation with them first about taking on tasks before talking to volunteers. So there's been no meaningful consultation or engagement with with unions on this, and it's been left to local organisers to follow up locally. Although volunteers is not um, a a new concept, and it has been used in the NHS, of course, but staff there um, had concerns too, uh, concerns around the blurring of the boundaries between paid staff and volunteers affecting patient safety and confidentiality, the blurring of the lines around um, volunteers being brought in to baby mask employee numbers, for example, and I appreciate that these are two very different working environments. However, they're both very heavily procedure-led in the NHS. 
an arrangement did come into uh, an agreement was reached between the, the rail unions, the volunteer company, and the sorry the the health unions, the um, and the and the volunteer company to to put staff anxiety at bay. And I think you know I can't stress enough that there needs to be an open discussion around how we bring volunteers into into the sector. And colleagues, on that note, I will end my contribution. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. That's a, a really helpful contribution. You've raised some very pertinent issues, which I'm sure we'll want to come back to. Could I now ask David Simon from Transport Focus to give us a passenger angle? David. John, sorry, can I just uh, interrupt before that? Um, Steve Rotherham and David Jarvis both had questions. I'm um, taking questions yeah. right until we've finished all the presentations. Thank you, John. Okay. David. Okay. Yeah, thank you, John, and thank you uh, again to the board for uh, inviting Transport Focus to, to speak today and to be part of the board in the future. I mean, just very, very quickly, Transport Focus, those are less familiar with our work, with a statutory uh, transport user watchdog um, created by Parliament to promote the interests of transport users, that's passengers, bus, coach and tram passengers uh, in England outside of London, and also for those that rely on the strategic road network and the major A road networks as well. Um, what we try to do is be useful, provide an evidence base, which is absolutely rooted in consumer research. So for transport users, that's very much about speaking to those people who use transport, who find very barriers to using transport as well. And particularly thinking about this, these past three months, I guess the exam question set in David Hogarth's paper is looking at the past three months and the, and the immediate uh, future. I think we know from rail passengers right throughout Great Britain, and particularly true in the north, is that they want a rail service that uh, provides good value for money, reliable, punctual, uh, and very much the past three months they've been getting that. And I think for those key workers, those people making essential journeys, they've been getting that. It's, it's a very, very punctual, reliable. Jane has said in her stats, and I think a, a great shout out and thanks to frontline staff providing an excellent service and delivering for that. But it was absolutely rely on services. What we've done, it's mentioned in David Hogarth's paper, is over the past six or seven weeks now, we've been picking up some of the key issues that we've been picking up from passengers. That includes right at the start of all this, is those passengers who didn't travel, couldn't travel, and they were looking for help and support if they perhaps had annual season tickets, uh, so people who were looking for refunds and annual season tickets and while well, there's been a few bumps along the road over the over the past few months with some train operators and pleased to say that both Transpennine and Northern have started to gear on that and certainly now tackled the backlog of requests from passengers wanting refunds on annual season tickets, which I'll come back to at the end of my sort of brief uh, discussion. The next bit in this of course is people have been returning to using the railway and, and other forms of public transport. And I guess the best way I can summarise this is that everything we've ever done with bus, understanding bus passengers' needs, rail passengers' needs, has been very much grounded in trust and confidence. And a slight undermining of that, not because of the core essential of delivering a punctual, reliable service. It's been driven by that unknown factor now around safety and safety's broader sense of health and safety. And I think certainly what we've understood from passengers is that concern about what can I expect when I start using that, that train again? And actually what's expected of me? I don't want to be that person that does the wrong thing in the wrong place. So reassurance and communication and confidence in using transport has been absolutely key. We've been tracking the views of around 2,000 people in Great Britain over the past six, seven weeks, asking various questions around what levels of reassurance they need. And certainly the, the, the key factors that have, have shown some interesting variations over the weeks have been attitudes towards face coverings, and certainly last week after the announcement by the Secretary of State, we've seen an increase now in people saying that they will feel much more reassured. But it has been pretty high anyway. It's been around about 60 percent of people saying they would only use public transport if other passengers were uh, wearing a face covering. What's, what has been consistently strong, there was the issue about social distancing. And around 70 percent of passengers say there said that people saying that they would only use public transport if safe social distancing was in place which is clearly a difficult thing for public transport, let's be honest. Uh, social distancing and public transport don't always go hand in hand with fairly capacity, so that's a challenge ahead as well. And I think thinking about that level of reassurance and communication, what we did, we went to the all train operating companies, including Transpennine and Northern, a couple of weeks ago with a series of asks on behalf of passengers, thinking about the information they're providing on websites, information coming out through other outlets as well, and sort of setting some exam questions about the level of reassurance that they, they believe they're offering through websites. We were 
forward a couple of times, but again, I'm very pleased to say that both TransPennine Express and Northern listened to what we said. They made um, improvements to their websites to give what we believe is good, clear advice and clear that needs to be kept on top of in, in the days and weeks as more people come back. And I think really just to kind of finish off really is that what we've seen through our ongoing research with, um, with, trans, with, with people across Great Britain is obviously the challenge now of getting people onto public transport in, in, in a safe way. Thinking about, as I mentioned right at the start, season tickets, where are the, uh, where are the incentives as we think about reforming parts of our ticketing system potentially? Is the annual season ticket on rail a product that's no longer applicable? Do we need more flexible season products or, or ticketing products that will encourage people to perhaps return two or three days a week to the railway to fit in with work? Um, and actually now the ability to do more of these sorts of sessions remotely. We found out from our work as well, and it won't come as a surprise, more people are considering using the car. It may feel safer to them to do so rather than using public transport. There's, there's clearly messages out there which are giving some concern to, to people. So we've got to think about how we entice people back on through our in a safe way. Some of that will be through cost. Some of that will be convened. Some of that will be about building reassurance. And I think the key question is people come back to transport um, on Monday, potentially making the first visits to go to sort of retail or uh, exploring their new social bubble as they have got to do, is thinking about particularly how um, giving them the reassurance that they know what to expect and what's expected of them. And I'll, I'll finish there. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Uh, really helpful points uh, and your research is really useful. Can I then finally come to Richard George from the LLR just to comment on the end of the 100 day plan and then of course I'll open up for comments starting with Steve and Dan. So Richard first. Thank you John. Um, yeah you're right, uh, beginning of this week was the end of our 100 days um, and I think there are a number of things I'd like to point out about that. First of all we have a, um, uh, undertaken a review of Northern Trains. It's not been an external top down review by consultants. This is a review that was primarily undertaken by the management and staff of MTL uh, to look at their own operation on the basis of asking the people who are responsible for it is a good place to start. Uh, so Nick and his team have done a very, very good job in doing that, given that their prime focus over the last few weeks has been all about the pandemic and the response to it. The COVID-19 position has made anything remotely resembling a plan very difficult. We're in a position at the moment of the very unpredictable future. We can't predict the future currently. We can't uh, know the affordability currently. We don't know the dynamics. COVID has made even the preparation of a budget at the moment extremely difficult. So we've not been able to produce a business plan in the way that I certainly envisaged at the beginning of March. Um, but what the review has done is looked at all the things that need to be done within the business and fundamentally, in short, that is to get the basics right. Um, because getting the basics right for reliable delivery is fundamentally what Northern Trains has to do. Uh, and although we've not been able to, to create a plan in the normal sense, a uh, very pleased report NTL already getting on with the actions to deliver on that. So there's a revised management structure, a few new phases in it, extra train cleaning, improvements in staff accommodation, improved processes for planning and reliability, uh, some additional staff numbers we think we need for additional greater resilience to the operation. And at the next uh, appropriate World North Committee, we'll, give, we'll present all this in terms of the actions that we're currently taking to get the operation and get the basics right. Um, None of these things are strategic. These are all, these are not strategic choices. They're not changes to the specification. They're not changes to the, uh, the services or anything else. The more strategic issues for Northern will come as part of a strategic review of the fleet that we do now. And we have to now do a more strategic review of the fleet because we know that the age of the fleet is, is going on. Um, and we need to put those strategic choices into the context of whatever the Northern Hub Performance Recovery Task Force uh, come through with. Uh, and there's lots of work going on there, which many of you will be aware of, um, and because that's aiming at a performance-led timetable for December 21. So the task force...
may not have considered. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Steve. A very telling point. I think throughout the whole of COVID-19, the challenge has been implementing necessary policy decisions on the ground with support of all involved. And that's been challenging in very trying circumstances. But through Transport for the North and the Rail Committee and the Rail North Partnership, I agree that we can bring these things together and draw in the extra inputs that we need, as we are doing today with our trade union and passenger representative friends. I think Dan Jarvis was next. Um, thanks very much. I can, I can see a range of hands have gone up, so I'm going to be very, very quickly. Um, my question was either for Anna Jane or for Richard, and it was just about rolling stock. So is there sufficient rolling stock at the moment? And if there isn't, is that because of the social distancing requirements or is it down to an inherent lack of trains? So, would, Richard, would you like to have a crack at that? And uh, James, if you could then alert me who else is waiting. Uh, certainly, I've now managed to unmute myself. So, I, yeah. Um, uh, it's not a shortage of rolling stock. I think there are two fundamental issues. One is I agreed with what Beth Farhad had to say about longer rolling stock. I think longer rolling stock would be good. It would be strategically helpful going forward. In the short term, longer rolling stock is limited by what platforms we can use it on. Um, and the biggest constraint we have currently in terms of the service is the availability of staff that, who are shielded or... Um, um, what's the other word? Sorry. God. Uh, the, the staff who are not available to work at the moment. And that is our biggest constraint in terms of increased services. There is unquestionably a capacity problem, as, as David Sidebottom mentioned. You know, mass transit and two metre social distancing don't sit hand in hand very comfortably. Uh, and the fact is that um, two metre social distancing has a very much more uh, capacity constraining effect than even one meter social distancing would have in terms of the number of people we can get on a train. And so, frankly, it is not going to need much of more people to come back onto the railway at peak times to find where it's difficult to maintain the two meter social distancing because the capacity available to us is not designed that way um, to, to deliver. Thank, thank you, Richard. James, could you alert me on who else you wish me to draw in? James Lyon? Yes, Chair, and we have uh, Councillor Keith Little, Mayor Andy Burnham, Councillor Stuart Swinburne, Peter Kennan, and Councillor Judith Blake. OK, thank you very much. I'm going to take these, thank you James, I'm going to take these in threes uh, and then ask for a response to questions. So I'm going to start with Keith, then go to Andy, then go to Stuart and then get some responses. So Keith first. Yeah, thank you John. It's good to see everybody as usual. Uh, it was just a point that was raised by Beth Fahart and I'm pleased to welcome Beth and uh, look forward to working with her at, the, uh, at, at our organisation. It was regarding volunteers, and the government seems to be employing massive amount of volunteers at the moment. Um, but could I just suggest that perhaps volunteers on the unmanned stations would be really beneficial? Uh, and I think we have a network of community rail partnerships, uh, and perhaps contacting the community rail partnerships would be a fantastic way of getting our unmanned stations uh, to uh, work with the public on uh, social isolation and stuff like that. Oh, thanks very much indeed. Thanks. Thank Andy Burnham. Thanks, uh, thanks, John. Um, can I just say how marvellous it's felt to have a fully functional railway for the last uh, three months? It's been uh, very, very uh, pleasant indeed. Um, I think that is uh, partly down to the strange time we're in, but also. I want to say again to Richard and all of his team for the way in which OLR has gone about its work. I think it has brought some culture change uh, to the railways, uh, more engagement of frontline uh, staff. Uh, and just echoing Steve and, and Keith, really pleased to see uh, Beth here today. Thanks, uh, Beth. I think reflecting uh, contributions um, from frontline staff will enhance the work of this uh, of this 
uh, board. So it's, it's positive, John, but I'm just going to ask a question picking up on something that Anna Jane uh, said and something that's in the paper. Anna Jane talked of an uplift in services on the 6th of July and the paper talks of a further uplift in September. Now, of course, I understand the need to get more capacity onto the system. However, I am worried that the stability I spoke of might begin to be disrupted again as those services increase. And I think that would make it really difficult if we had trains with low capacity that were arriving late and, you know, all of the issues that we're familiar with. So my kind of question is, you know, what is the percentage uplift in services on in July and then September? And actually, can we not get to a point where we put too many trains back in that we start to get chaos again? Let's not operate in the normal timetable frame. I think we keep services out, John, in this particular time uh, if adding more in is going to begin to, to, to make things uh, chaotic and unpredictable again. So, you know, I, I would say let's not wait for the normal timetable processes. Let's let's change the timetable now and keep the stability that we're enjoying. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for your very positive comments about uh, how thing, PPM levels at 98 percent. It's a long time since we've seen that. Uh, and then Stuart Swinborne, please. Yeah, thank you, uh, Chair. Um, just a couple of observations, really, and, and a question. But uh, my observation at the moment relating around uh, communication that we've talked about and the publicity side of things. Um, we've had uh, in North East Lincolnshire, we've had really good communication and publicity from the services that have been run by Transpanine and uh, East Midland Trains. But unfortunately, they haven't been so forthcoming with the services provided by Northern. So we've got a, a bit of a concern on that, so maybe we can get a comment on that. Um, the other one comment I want to make is that the, the Barton line that we have in North East Lincoln has suffered really badly during the COVID-19. Many of the services have been running late and cancellations. And it's the, really it's what's worrying us is a fragmented way that the service is currently run by Northern, uh, trains by East Midlands and TPE. It does not help us, though, when we're talking about these sort of things, that low passenger numbers are a result. We know we've got no control over that. But there is a danger that the service would be reduced or cancelled if low use does continue. So maybe a comment on that. But a question I'd like to ask John, if possible, is it's a bit hypothetical, I know, but uh, when services do return to 100%, how will non-essential travel to tourist destinations such as Cleethorpes be managed? Or is it to be expected that uh, the non-essential travel only message is likely to be dropped? So I'll be right for reply on those. Thank you very much, John. OK, so I, I think those three questions from Keith, Andy and Stuart relate very closely to three answers. So, Beth, could I ask you to say a bit more about volunteering in relation to Keith Little's comment about the way of building a partnership here between employees and volunteers? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think um, I tried to make it clear in <clears throat> sort of the presentation that y unions at the moment are opposing the use of volunteers because there hasn't been any discussion and there are staff anxieties around the introduction of uh, volunteers, around the blurring of the lines of, you know, bringing volunteers in to do other people's jobs when we know that there are a, um, a large bank of uh, well staff that have been stood down that should be consulted actually as part of the process so when talking about clarity and communication um, and workers rights I think you need to have a clear consultation and that starts with the trade union and my understanding is that uh, DFT has not consulted with trade unions around the use of volunteers and before we start talking about using volunteers to uh, manage unstaffed stations there needs to be a conversation with the trade unions first um, and, and that's I guess that's our position and that's the starting position Thank you very much Beth, well hopefully this can be taken forward offline in the way that you describe. Thank um, you Anna Jane, could I ask you to pick up two points please Andy's point about the uplifting services and perhaps being quite pragmatic about not feeling a need to return to full services if those full services could not maintain social distancing. And then if you could just briefly comment on Stuart's point about where that would leave with the uplift of services, would leave non-essential services, particularly to the important tourist destinations across the north, frankly, from Cleethorpes up to Carlisle. 
Yeah, no problem. Um, so, yeah, absolutely um, acknowledge and, and recognise the, the challenge that Andy's describing there in, in terms of uplifting. Um, and we are very much committed to doing this gradually in a controlled fashion. And, and you know, with that in mind that we don't want to disrupt the system. Um, it, it, it hasn't felt like a normal railway for me these past few weeks. So I wouldn't recognise I wouldn't recognise that. But I, I know you're getting that. We've had we've had wonderful levels of, of performance um, in recent weeks. And we do want to try and maintain that resilience resilience just as much as we can um, it's a real balance of balancing resilience with reliability and with capacity and, and and those are moving parts at the moment more than ever so linking the two questions together you know delivering the correct amount of capacity to the correct places is always a challenge for our for our system and especially on a, a mixed traffic railway that we operate in the north with multiple multiple big cities to connect and multiple different types of community and different types of passenger that's always a challenge that we try and meet but now more than ever I'd say it's a bigger challenge because those capacity requirements are, are changing and are different than what we're used to dealing with so non-essential travel is a really big part of that um, the rules at the moment are that it is only essential travel so that's what we are we are working to but inevitably at a point in time that will change we assume um, and, and when it does we'll have to react to that and try as best as we can with the resources available uh, working with the operators to provide you know what we can and, and as I mentioned the, the contingency working group has been really key to that in terms of taking that feedback and trying as much as we can to react um but without disrupting the system. And we, we know all too well, and I, I don't like to mention May 18 too much, and not every time I speak to you, but it's, it, it is just worth recognising that we try and adhere to the planning timescales of the industry for a reason, because it, it is more stable when we do that, and we learned that from May 18. So if we all work together on the same timescales and do it on a planned basis, using our national project management office and working with our operators, we have a far better chance of having a resilient underlying timetable to, to operate and that's that's better for everyone in the in the long term thank you very much anna jane and then briefly richard um there was a comment from stuart about the importance of communications but one or two glitches it appeared in relation to north lincolnshire yes thank you john i'm happy you've got a comment on that can i can i just comment firstly uh before i come back to stuart's point on two things first of all the volunteers issue I can agree with Beth completely there won't be any volunteers on Northern without consultation with the staff first uh, and on LNER which is another one of the tops inside my group um, we have several hundred catering staff not doing anything at the moment we'll, we'll be looking to use those before any is brought in um, and on Andy's point uh, it is absolutely clear um, that the performance um, uplift has to go a, a, any uplift in the service has to be with maintaining the sort of performance we want to have it, we're not going to just shove things in willy nilly it has to be considered and, and, and Nick Donovan is very very clear in his instruction from us that actually we will increase services as we need to but absolutely not at the expense of reliability while we do it uh, and it's still as much as anything to do with capacity of staff and resources as it is to do with demand. On the detailed piece from Stuart, um, I can see Mr Nick Donovan has got his hand up because Nick as the managing director of Northern, I'm sure will be able to answer in much greater detail than any woolly answer I could give Stuart. So I'd I'm like to pass it to Nick if I I'm could. happy to pass it to Nick, but not in greater detail. Nick, you're very welcome to okay. contribute, but we have a whole staff of board members wanting to ask questions, and we really don't have very much time. So uh, it's a point source question. Can it have a point source answer, please? So thank you, John. And just to reassure Councillor Swinburne that we have certainly set out to communicate in North East Lincolnshire. If something has gone wrong there, then uh, I will ask the team to engage offline directly and, and we can have that discussion and pick up those particular um, concerns. But certainly the Barton on Humber service specifically has been a matter that I have been discussing personally um, over the last uh, week or so. So I'll ask the team to engage directly uh, with Councillor Swinburne on that point. Thank you, Nick, and thank you for all you're doing at Northern. I'm now going to come to Peter Cannon, and after Peter, I'm going to ask Judith Blake, and after Judith, I'm going to ask Louise Gittin. Peter. 
thank you, Chair. I'd just like to make a point about um, the involvement of the LEPs in the process, please. Um, the, the 11 Northern LEPs are not represented on Rail North or on the Northern Rail Expert Panel that was set up. I know there is CBI representation on there. Uh, why does that matter? Well, it matters a lot at the moment because of our economic recovery plans and trying to feed in uh, business opinion into the, the work that's been done by the train operators and by Network Rail. And we are very grateful for the excellent job that's been done through the lockdown in relation to that. But we, we would like to have the opportunity of feeding in comments. Uh, secondly, there are issues like the Castlefield Corridor, which impact on the strategic economic plans of each LEP, because international connectivity at Manchester Airport is so vital, and we don't get the opportunity, because we're not represented on these bodies, to give any meaningful input, and we can't clog this board meeting with making such comments. So I would like to just make a plea to Network Rail and the operators, please use the LEPs uh, as a business voice, please engage with us. Point very well made, Peter. Thank you. I'll come back to that when we've had all three questions. Judith? Um, thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, just, uh, um, I don't want to repeat the comments that have been made, but an enormous thank you to everyone for the presentations and the work that, um, that you're doing in such difficult, um, difficult times. Um, I, um, I just want to focus on the, um, the area of communication because um, very often we um, assume that because communication has been done once that that's enough and this is complex and it will need to be repeated and, um, and, f and done in ways that are you know, really accessible to all of the potential um, users of the transport network. If we could make sure um, that the communication is... Um, um, you know, different languages uh, or, you know, a whole range of issues around disability that we need to uh, bring forward. Um, I think it's absolutely clear in many of these areas that we're not going to get um, passengers back on the systems and, unless there's a massive increase in confidence. Um, and I think um, it's absolutely crucial that we have that communication to help increase um, that confidence. Um, it was it's really regrettable. Um, I think the system we've now got that ministers feel they announced, uh, need to announce, make announcements that their five o'clock briefings and the announcement about masks came out without um, the operators being aware. Uh, there isn't the detail about the, um, the type of um, face coverings and masks. And I think we'll get a whole range of face coverings as a result of that. And I think it's a big ask of um, staff. Um, you know, if they're having to judge whether those face coverings are adequate or not. And I think that's something that needs to be carefully considered. Um, the other um, imperative is around hand washing, um, sanitizers. Um, I just wondered if um, Network Rail have put any thought into additional hand washing facilities um, in on platforms, on stations, um, you know, all, all businesses, retail, everyone is looking at how they can improve their facilities around this. And I think that we need to take that very, very ser seriously indeed. Um, I want to say an enormous thank you to Beth and David for their contribution, because I think, um, you know, it's that it's it's work through the um, trade unions into into staff, um, uh, but also to the users of the networks that we're going to. Um, um, make the progress we need. My real concern about the use of volunteers is the whole issue of safeguarding. And we found, you know, that this hasn't been um, perhaps the priority. It needs to be through all of the other volunteering activities as local authorities we've been asked to have oversight of. So, you know, if we're asking volunteers to be at unrun stations, then we need to think about the security of the volunteers as well as the security um, of um, the passengers. So um, a plea, please, to, for more clarity around the passenger promise, the work that we've been doing on that, so that the voice of passengers and their needs um, is really um, picked up. Um, I did ask at the Rail North Committee that the trade union, um, the TUC uh, representation was a regular item on our TFN board because I think this is going to be an ongoing issue, so I hope that um, we've recognised the value 
of the contribution today and that that can be enacted um, on um, on behalf um, of um, the board. Um, the other issue is for Richard, really. LNNER has actually brought in the continental system of um, seat bookings and you can only travel on trains if you have a seat booking. Is this something that is being considered right across the network and is it something that um, will have an impact on future services and help to uh, address the overcrowding issues that we've all had to face in terms of making sure that we've got trains of adequate um, length and frequency as we go forward. Thank you. Louise? Thank you. Sorry, I just struggled to unmute myself. Um, yeah, I, I agree with everything that Judith's been saying, and I don't want to repeat some of those, but I think the messaging is really important, not just on the, on the stations, but on the trains as well. Um, I'm not sure what the situation will be with around toilets. Um, I know certainly as a local authority, we're not opening any of our toilets, but I appreciate if people are traveling for a long distance and they may, they'll need to access toilets of some um, description. And I think um, all of the issues around infection control and toilets is going to be really important. Uh, Judith and I, and apologies if there's anyone else here are involved as a, a beacon council in test, track and trace. Um, and I, I can envisage um, issues where maybe people will come back positive who've been on the train and it'd be interesting to see how we can link into what uh, nationally is happening with test track and trace and certainly with local government as well so it's just really a, an observation around that so I don't know if any thoughts being given to it but um, I think travel the travel the more that public travel around the more um, that the test track and trace is going to have to be really focused on different areas and that's all. Thank you. Thank you. I see from the chat bar that Ben Smith from the department wants to make a brief comment. Ben? No, it looks like we've lost Ben. Never mind. Um, sorry. Sorry, John. I, I unmuted and then muted myself again. Sorry about that. Um, hopefully you can hear me now. Um, okay. I just wanted to briefly come back. I know a number of board members have made, raised the really important topic of face coverings. Um, just to let you know, there is a huge amount of work going on in the department on that at the moment. Uh, clearly, we recognise that we need to come out with more guidance on how that is going to work in practice next week and also how the enforcement regimes are going to work. Uh, it's just to reassure you that work is ongoing and we will come back to people and let you know how that's going to work as soon as we possibly can. I know that the teams involved have been talking to local authorities uh, across the country on that already, so there has been some discussion uh, we need to finalise that and we're planning to do so as soon as we can. Thank you very much. That's helpful. Um, Peter Cannon's comment about the LEPs. Clearly, this came up at our last meeting and uh, Barry and I have been discussing this. Often we, for obvious reasons, work very closely with officers in statutory authorities, but we are a partnership board of business and civic leaders and we need to make sure the LEPs have full involvement. So, um, Peter, leave that with us. We'll take that offline and make sure we capture LEP input in the area of rail operations in the appropriate way. Obviously, some very important comments um, on a range of areas from, from Judith and others about communications. Um, we don't have time to go through all of them in detail. But Anna Jane, I think there was a specific question to you about hand cleaning uh, on platforms. And there was also the, Louise's point about linking what the train companies are doing uh, with test, track and trace. So if I come to Anna Jane first and then Richard, George, could you pick up the point on seat bookings in advance? Anna Jane. Yeah, um, so I touched very briefly upon um, cleaning and, and, and sanitising um, during during my introduction. We have enhanced our cleaning regime, as have the TOCs at their stations, um, and that includes provision of hand sanitizer where possible and practicable. Um, should also just conscious of time but briefly mention a product that we're um we've been using for a number of weeks now and the talks are now beginning to roll out where possible on some of their kit which is a, a product that you may have heard, heard of called zuno which is a um an antibacterial um covering basically 
basically that you you apply to a, a solid surface that might be in our case a signal panel that's a shared piece of kit between employees or it could be a, a grab rail on a train they're going to be fogging the trains with it um in, in due course so that lasts 28 days and provides protection and um, indoors i believe it's shorter than that in an outdoor area such as a um a station that's uncovered and um, but that's going to offer us a, a bit more protection in terms of sanitization and, and judith's really right to raise it because face coverings is obviously part of this isn't it but we we shouldn't forget that we also still need to keep up with the other um important elements of keeping social distance and washing our hands you know etc so i think that's a really important point in our posters and our messaging that we've been consistent on through the rdg collective and um, really does enforce the whole package rather than um purely face masks and coverings yeah Thank you very much. And um, Richard, do you just want to touch on seat bookings? Yes, thank you, Judith. Uh, thank you, John. Um, seat reservations, um, compulsory seat reservations and um, all seat reservations for things like l &E are, are feasible. Um, they're certainly feasible for long distance trains where people know in advance when they're going to make that journey and it is feasible that you could imagine a situation where companies like NER moved to uh, compulsory seat reservations with every ticket. It's never been done other than under certain circumstances, and we're in one of those certain circumstances at the moment. It occasionally gets done on things like Monday, Thursday, where there's a lot of travel as well. Um, and the reason it's not normally done is because me, even on the long distance routes, there are usually... Um, commuter distance uh, locations where people expect to just turn up and go and turn up and go doesn't work with compulsory reservations it is it is an option for long distance travel um, for shorter distance and commuter travel and uh, many that means many many journeys in and around you know the, the metropolitan areas of the north it would be much more difficult there are no systems currently to do it and it would be much more difficult when you've got um, what are essentially turn up and go services because you'd need to know in advance when you're traveling. It is, does get looked at from time to time. Um, and it's certainly a possibility for long distance trains, but much more difficult to put into effect on short distance. Thank you very much. So looking to James Lyon now, we, we've really used up our time more than half the meeting on this very important item. Um, is there anybody else that is particularly keen to contribute? Uh, Phil Riley has requested to speak, please. Chair. Okay, and um, can I just ask anybody else to speak up now if they need to come in, but we are running out of time. Uh, okay, I'll take Phil Riley and then we'll wrap this item. Phil. <laughs> Phil, you're on the you're on mute there. Wasn't. There you go. No, still on mute, Phil. No, you're fine. You're fine. That's it. I can't hear you, Phil. I know. Um, you, I can hear you now. Right. Sorry, wanted to just raise the issue of compliance um, with the new standards. Um, there's, there's nothing will I mean we're, we're having we're finding with some of the things that we are reopening in the centre of Blackburn that not everybody is um, signed up to these, the new normal um, and nothing will undermine um, passenger confidence more than the presence in carriages of belligerent non-compliant members of the public and I, I mean it'll put you know, it, it's, it's just a very simple point. It obviously raises the question about what happens, who's supposed to deal with it. But it, I, I, I sense it will become an issue. Thank you very much. I think that's a good point at which to pull threads together if nobody else is um, urgently needing to speak. Um, very important session. Very good set of conversations. I mean, I thought Andy Burnham put his finger on it in the challenge as capacity is used up as people get more confident to use the trains and the challenge that will bring for social distancing. And I'm sure we would wish to operate using the best available scientific advice 
to guide us through that particular conundrum. So thanks again to all of our speakers, Anna Jane, Beth, uh, David and Richard, and to contributions from, gosh, 10 members of the board. So we've done quite well to involve as many people as possible. And a number of points we can pick up offline, including at the um, Rail North Committee. So if we leave that item there, I thank our guests for being at the meeting and go back to the normal board meeting. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks very much. Bye. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Right. Um, item five, then, is the economic recovery plan. This item is about uh, accelerating investment, uh, bringing forward investment in electric charging, accelerating maintenance, promoting investment in active travel. And uh, the proposal to the board is in paragraph 3.1, which is to endorse the principle that we should develop an economic recovery plan to finish that work by July. So we'll come back to it in July, working with officers, including, of course, most importantly, our LEPs in this, on this occasion, and also that we should seize the moment after this meeting of writing to the Secretary of State with some quick wins, and there are some quick wins in paragraph 4.10. So that was just to summarise the paper in the interest of time. So in that sense, it's not a decision-making item today. The work will be done and brought back, uh, but the proposal is we seize the moment by giving the Secretary of State some hopefully helpful quick wins. Um, I'm going to throw it open now for a short session of questions, if anybody would like to contribute. James Lyon, have you anybody waiting, please, James? Uh, Rob Waltham, Councillor Swinburne and Councillor Craig Brown, please, Chairman. Who was the third, James? Uh, Councillor Craig Brown. Craig Brown, thank you. Sorry, you were just breaking up as you spoke. I'm sorry, the first one. Uh, Rob Walton. Rob, of course, Rob Walton. Yes, thank you. I've got them now. Rob, Stuart and Craig. So we'll take them in that order. Rob? Um, thank you, Chairman. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak on this one. I think it's an incredibly important paper, and I'm just acknowledging, of course, that, as you say, this is not uh, for decision now, but I think this is, we have great opportunity. I mean, we've as a council leader, as, and I'm sure council leaders and, and other um, uh, heads have, have had uh, letters from the government recently saying that they, they're keen to make investments, so we should be seizing on every single possible opportunity to promote schemes that we know will be uh, transformational and, and obviously push the environment agenda, which, of course, uh, I think uh, progressive uh, rail uh, uh, transportation does. So... So I think just to say absolutely in support of this paper and, and I look forward to seeing the schemes that come back, um, uh, you know, in the future. And just to acknowledge as well that I've not been around for a while, so it's good to see you all and I'll, see you all, I'll, I'll stick with you and see you all again soon. It's very good to have you with us today, Rob, as ever. Stuart Swinburne. Yes, thanks, uh, Chair. Just a couple of uh, points just to highlight of the quick wins that North East Lincolnshire have, uh, have submitted, actually, and we're hoping that they will come to fruition, but... Um, we have a big issue with the Europac uh, bus bridge, which is a, a £2 million plus investment, and we're hoping for something on that. It's very important that we also highlight in this present situation about cycling, and now people are, are getting to work more using cycling rather than public transport. The cycle superhighway between Cleveland and Birmingham is very important to us. And also, the long-going issue now has been over a year with Network Rail. We've been in discussions about Subject lane crossing, and um, we're getting to a stage there now. But it's a finance situation now, and Network Rail is saying it's a three million pound project. But uh, you know we're looking forward to that and uh, working with uh, government ministers and our MPs to try and get the finance in place for that. Well, they're just a couple of the, the quick wins we're looking for. But one of the concerns we had was the A180, the big bridge structural improvement. We submitted uh, a seven million pound DFT uh, challenge fund bid for that, but now we've been informed that the DFT have now cancelled these sort of challenge funding bids. So that's a concern to us. And, and on, long, on the long-term rail strategy, we've been on about this for a long time. The London direct train required between Doncaster and Grimsby 
is to be added as part of the greater project along the South Penang Lane. Um, we're looking for accelerated development as well, Chair. Looking forward to the Grimsby Western Relief Road that's going to enable early development of a regionally significant housing site consisting of 3,500 units, schools, local centre and retail units. So these are the sort of things that we're looking for within the economic delivery uh, recovery plan, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm sure the staff will follow up with your staff on that. And finally, Craig Brown, please. Thank you very much, John. Yeah, I just wanted to, to briefly draw attention to the proposed principles set out at 4.9, uh, and particularly uh, 4.9D, the supporting investment in active travel. Um, it's about a year ago since the first time I attended this board, and we had a presentation from Chris Boardman. Um, I don't actually think we've discussed active travel since then. Um, as a board, so um, I am pleased to uh, and welcome the, uh, the the request to fund active travel on a sustained basis um, in this report. I, I think possibly one of the reasons we haven't discussed it um, as a board is that um, it's seen as a local travel authority issue, yeah. um, but it's about far more than just painting uh, white lines on highways. Um, and frequently, if we're looking at new active travel routes, um, that does involve investment in the physical infrastructure, particularly um, where roads need to be widened because they're not wide enough to accommodate cycles um, and cars at the same time. Um, so I just wanted to highlight this because I think it, it is really important that we continue to flag it up um, if we are serious about active travel. Thank you. Thank you very much. We, we have a commitment, Craig, that we will do more on active travel. So your point really brings us back up to up to speed. Um, James, any more comments required? Uh, Councillor Heather Scott, uh, Steve Curl and Mayor Andy Burnham. In, in that order, Chairman. Yeah. OK, Heather, please. Do we have Heather Scott on the line? Might be unmuting. No, it looks not. Can I move then to Steve Curl? Yeah, thank you, John. Um, Cumbria is very supportive of all of the proposals in this paper, and Keith's now left the meeting, but that's both the Council and the LEP. Um, we wanted just to make the point that I think it's important both in the indicative letter to the Secretary of State and to the follow-up work that will be submitted that we include all options, so sustainable and inclusive uh, portfolio of potential projects for early deployment, and that we do that um, right across the range of travel modes, as already been suggested, including active travel, uh, and both the scale and the geographic diversity of those projects, both from rural areas right through to the metropolitan areas. A balanced portfolio, we think, is far more likely to be successful. Thank you very much. Very useful piece of guidance there. Andy Burnham. Thanks. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think it's important to make a point about coordinating our effort here. You know, I support the, the idea of a letter, but obviously city regions particularly might be putting in bids as well. So just to, to emphasise that we need to be um, clear about how we, how we go about this. The substantive point, John, is to ask whether or not a principle could be added under 4.9. Um, and I, I feel very strongly about this, um, that investment should be um, made to support the integration of transport at a local level, particularly to, particularly to city region level. We currently have, a, and this relates to the challenges of COVID-19 and the recovery of the transport system. We currently have a situation where we have a direct deal uh, from the government to support Metrolink, um, but the bus industry is separately, directly being funded uh, by uh, by the DFT. Now, I don't think that arrangement allows you to, to get the best out of the capacity and to integrate uh, services. Uh, and I think we should be moving to a situation where city regions have integrated funding so that we can begin to, to work towards this uh, aim that we all have of a London-style uh, public transport system. So could one of the principles be routing funding via city regions uh, for uh, bus, light rail, um, 
so that we can begin to integrate uh, and, and begin the, the public service, uh, sorry, the public transport reform that, that many of us are seeking uh, seeking to do. And it would be helpful if TFN could support us in making that argument to the Department of Government. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just going to check if Heather Scott from Teesside is on the line. Yes, I think you should. Can you hear me now? Yes, yeah, sorry about before. Uh, just really to comment on paragraph 410, good cross-section of schemes that have been put forward there for quick wins, just particularly to uh, say I'm very pleased to see the River Tees Crossing, Darlington Station and Middlesbrough Station. And we've had some, thank you for your support in all of that. We've had some positive responses both for Middlesbrough Station and Darlington Station and hopefully the Tees Crossing will be the next one. So thank you very much for your support. Well, that's very good to hear, Heather. Thank you for those comments. Um, right, I, I appreciate there may be other people, but I really do need to move this item on because we have quite a lot to, to do. So given this was not a decision making item, I'm going to make the following proposal as chair and then pause in case anybody wants to uh, disagree. My proposal is that we accept paragraph 3.1 which is that we should have a recovery plan, that we'll finish it in July working with members, but that we'll write with some early wins to the Secretary of State. With two additions, and those were the contributions from Steve and from Andy, both of which related to enhancing paragraph 4.9's principles. So I am going to put it to the board that that's what we will do. Please speak up if you're not supportive of that. Thank you very much for your support, colleagues. That's appreciated. Right. We are now moving to three items that are sorry. We are now moving to item six, which is future road investment. I already mentioned that there was some good news for the north in relation to dueling of the A66 and the Castle Street development uh, on A63 in Hull. I do just want to give a very brief opportunity to Jim O'Sullivan, the chief executive of Highways England, who supports these board meetings, to make a short contribution on the road investment strategy and particular plans in the north. Jim. Oh, thank you, John. Um, I, th I think the, the moment should be noted by these um, these two schemes. I mean, the total cost of the pair of uh, the A66 um, and the A63 is 1.4 billion. So we're very pleased um, to have those underway. We're also looking currently over and above what we promised on the A66. We're currently looking with government at acceleration um, options and being asked if it can be done more quickly. Um, I think over and above the road schemes, also pleased that it brings jobs to the north uh, and that a great many local companies and uh, uh, local employees will be involved in their delivery. So um, I think I think that's all the time. Just echo your pleasure at getting these schemes underway. Well, th thank you, Jim, for your strong advocacy of the North's interest in, in moving these schemes forward and particularly pleased to hear your point that we may be able to accelerate the A66 uh, uh, work. That would be really helpful. James Lyon, do we have any members wanting to comment on roads? Uh, Darren Hale, please, Chairman. Um, I'm going to come to Darren Hale and uh, Matthew Lamb. I don't feel you need to contribute, but I was perhaps alerted that you might want to say something. So, Darren first. Uh, hiya, John. Yes, sorry. Um, obviously, as I'm always uh, keen to, uh, to robustly uh, hold you to account and, and to criticise where necessary as well, I think it's only fair that we should uh, commend uh, um, the schemes, certainly the road schemes, certainly that benefit our, um, our region. Because obviously, the, uh, the A63 scheme to the docks from uh, Castle Street, which effectively links to the, the road to the docks in Hull, is obviously not just of benefit to to our fair city, but is benefit to, as a, a major major freight trading route to the whole of the north as an alternative to the uh, south, south coast port. So I think it, it, there's a sort of wider strategic M62 benefit. So again, if we can sort of in a minute record our thanks, certainly from Hull and I'm sure from the TFM board. And um, obviously we're looking forward to the opening of the, um, the bridge across the A63 as well that we've named after the uh, first... Uh, Along with Housing England, after the first uh, the first female GP in Hull, who was always a, a suffragette. So, 
We're looking forward to that opening soon as well. Thank you. Well, that's excellent. Thank you. Um, Matthew Lamb, did you want to say anything? Okay. Anybody else, James? Uh, yes. Uh, Michael Green, Stuart Swinburne and uh, Heather Scott, please. Okay. Michael, welcome to the meeting. Thank you, Chairman. Can you hear me? I can indeed. That's good. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the for the update, which is, which is to be welcomed. Uh, just if I can just pick up on one small point, which I think is a, probably a typing error. Uh, so on page two, uh, paragraph two point four, there's reference to the uh, scheme on the junction thirty three of the M six being delivered by the um, on Airways England. It's actually being delivered by Lancashire County Council. So, okay. so just a, just a small amendment. An important one. Thank you very thank much. Thank you, Chairman. Ha um, Stuart Swinburne. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Just to, to reiterate, I, I'm pleased for these two schemes that are going ahead. It's welcome news. Um, but as I've already mentioned about the uh, the Western Relief Road in Grimsby, um, we've already submitted that as a potential accelerated development scheme, as I mentioned earlier, in the Economic Delivery uh, Recovery Plan. But if this was not successful, then we would hope that we have some sort of support from uh, Transport for the North in our bid for future DFT funding in the large local major scheme. So we're looking for some sort of you know, supporting that sort of thing to, for the Grimsby Western Relief Road. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stuart. And Heather Scott. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr Chairman. Obviously, welcoming greatly the A66. And I just uh, would like to emphasise, if wherever possible, we can use as much local procurement as possible. I think this is something that certainly uh, most of the local authorities within the Tees Valley are trying to do, because I think this will help our economic recovery for the area. So I'd just like to emphasise that. Jim O'Sullivan, do you want to make any comment about uh, local procurement? Um, I, I think it's something that we've focused on much more, um, our relationships and our ability to manage um, small and medium enterprises. We've worked hard on it in the last two or three years. Um, over in the east of England uh, on the A14, despite the fact that program was 1.4 billion, it still had a huge content of um, local companies. Uh, they should um, start to align themselves with the tier one contractors that we use because we tend to involve local companies through them. Uh, but the opportunities are there. And I would ask that the various authorities here encourage local businesses to take an interest in these schemes and not just to assume that because it says Balfour Beatty over the door, that Balfour Beatty are doing everything. Thank you very much. Um, I think we'll leave roads there because we have some other very important items to um follow up on, but thank you for those contributions. The next three items are for note. They're not going to be presented. There's no NPR decisions to be taken today. But Andy Burnham, I know you'd registered. You wish to make a comment on point seven, paper seven, NPR. Thanks, Chair. I, I won't, uh, won't detain the meeting long. Um, it was just a follow up uh, from our discussion in Manchester in March, which was um, uh, recorded in the minutes, where Richard George presented his findings to us of uh, that, that exercise of comparing the surface option uh, um, for HS2 stroke MPR compared to the, uh, the, the underground option that board members know <laughs> have heard me uh, talk about before. Um, and what we got to in March was a really good position, I thought, where we just said, well, let's have a fair comparison now between an optimised uh, underground option versus the, the preferred, the, tier, the um, HS2 preferred surface option, and that that was a a good thing. It, what was added was a, a peer review of the the Bechtel work that that had led to the sort of new thinking about the underground option. Um, I, I picked up a sense, John, since that board meeting that the peer review in the end has been used to stall what, what I think was the express will of the board, which was to have that fair comparison, so that board members could just judge these two things both in terms of the benefits they bring, but also the cost of each. And, you know, as we've always said, if the cost of the underground option is you know, too large, then we, you know, we, we will go with a fair comparison and whatever the, the, the views were. But it seems to me that the peer review has, has stopped that fair comparison coming to this board. I know Barry has written to the minister uh, in the last uh, 24, 48 hours. I just want to say that I strongly welcome 
Barry's letter and I thank him uh, for writing it. I just think this is a critical decision for the North and nothing should stop this board from seeing the viable options presented to it and, and, and a final decision uh, made. Uh, and I think that's more important than ploughing on with a suboptimal option uh, that um, I don't think delivers all of the benefits the North needs. So it was just to, 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 to say that, uh, John, you know, this, a clear decision was taken in March. And I think it's really important that this board sticks to that, that position that we need to see that fair comparison. Uh, but I'll, I'll leave it there. I strongly welcome Barry's letter and thank him for it. So, so thanks for those comments, Andy. As you can imagine, Barry and I have been pursuing this in between the two board meetings. And Barry's letter was because we sensed that we needed to make our point very clearly and strongly to try and get some forward movement. I am just going to give the floor to Barry White. Uh, Barry, uh, anything you want to say about your letter to Andrew Stevenson? John, just to really agree with, with, with what Andy was saying is that we're not prejudging the issue here. We just want to see that comparison. We want to be able to present the board with the facts and um, you know, the opportunity to look at different methods of construction, such as a box type construction, which has been used before, may well be able to uh, build uh, a below, gr below ground level station at a lower cost than perhaps previous estimates suggested. And that's the exercise we really want to see um, taken forward. Thank you very much. Well, we're on the job on this one to get that comparison made. Um, any other comments on NPR? This was mainly a paper for note in addition to Andy's point, but I'll just give a moment of pause. Uh, Councillor Judith Blake and Councillor Stuart Swinburne would like to come in, please, Chairman. OK, Judith. Hi. Um, I also wanted to come in on um, item six, but I don't think you saw that I asked twice to come in. So if we could pick that up later, that would be really helpful. Um, I just, um, um, could you just clarify about consultation, um, what, what's proposed for consultation on the next stages? Um, and also, um, um, just, you know, how all of this um, fits into the integrated rail plan. I think that's... Um, something I'd like officials to just comment on, um, making sh you know, we need to make sure, obviously, we're going to be talking about phasing. Um, I just want um, uh, clarification about how we can be sure about, you know, what's coming forward on um, ways forward around the NPR proposals. Thanks. OK, and I don't want to lose your point on roads. Did you want to make no. it now? Take it offline. No, sorry, it was the item before that, the economic, economic recovery plan. Yeah, I've put it on the chat line. Um, it's just, um, you can, can, you, can you see it there? It just, um, I just think, you know, all of the conversations we're having about economic recovery um, across the north in particular, but across the country, um, um, are talking about, you know, making sure we, we um, um, include us around um, devolution wherever we possibly can. OK, thank you very much. Yeah, point, point well made. Um, Stuart, um, briefly, please, Stuart, we're losing time. Yeah, it's very, very brief, Chair, and uh, thank you. I know I'm asking a lot of questions, but All I right. think it's relevant and important to North East Lincolnshire at the moment. It's just following the National Infrastructure Commissioner's call for evidence for an integrated rail plan, will Transport for the North now include the wider growth areas, such as North East Lincolnshire, in the Northern Powhouse Rail, rather than just city connectivity? It's really important as passenger and freight volumes are going to grow in line with expected economic development across all of the North. So it's very important within the other context of the, uh, the Northern Powhouse Rail Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. So if I could come back to Tim Wood. Tim, what did you pick up on the point about consultation and the link with the IRP and Stuart's point about NPR yeah. being more than simply city connectivity? But if you could do it briefly, please. Yeah, thank you, Chair, and good afternoon, Board. Uh, so the non-statutory consultation has been paused. Currently, we want to make sure that the emerging costs and benefits work is completed, and I wouldn't expect now that to be done until after the delivery of the SOC, which is due for March 2021. Uh, in terms of the integrated rail plan, 
uh, we've worked really closely with with all our colleagues uh, within TFN and also uh, within the wider audience to make sure that we're very clear to the NIC um, what we need, what we want in terms of um, delivering a fully integrated rail solution across the north of England uh, and the benefits that will come out of that. In terms of the, uh, back to Councillor Stewart, in terms of the um, uh, North East Lincolnshire, so we, we've been really clear on the network uh, for NPR, but what the key pieces are is that our trains carry on to locations that actually uh, come into North Lincolnshire, and I think the whole strategy around an integrated rail plan actually looks at the north to make sure that the north receives that transformational railway. So we're really clear that the whole north is impacted by NPR, although you might not see uh, the fact that uh, you're actually located exactly on our map, but you will have trains coming from NPR into your areas. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Ian, Ian Craven and Nick Bisson both want to come in on that item as well, please. Okay, Ian. Thanks, John. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. I'll, um, oh. sorry, I've not got my camera on. Um, I just wanted to, to follow up on the discussion that we had previous, the previous, um, consultation call, um, with regard to the funding. And there was a discussion uh, at the, at that, on that particular call, um, off the back of what was in the monthly operating report. And subsequently, Barry wrote to the Secretary of State, um, just to just to uh, to raise that with him, um, as as uh, is is included in this this month's operating report by the third week in May, that issue was largely resolved. So we, as of now, we have commitments on NPR from the department in writing for for around forty six million, including the the, the VAT. Um, there is some um, caveats around what is called pre-sequence five work, which if you recall is the, the preparatory work on the outline business cases um, post OBC. Um, the department and TFN are currently reviewing that and that will be um, hopefully agreed or, or um, uh, made certain at the end of this month. Um, that is around five million pounds plus VAT. So, so th th there is a little bit of outstanding uncertainty in relation to the funding, um, but largely um, that issue is now resolved. That's good to hear, Ian. Thank you for following that up. And Ben Smith? Sorry, it was Nick, actually, John, if that's all right. Oh, Nick, Nick, Nick. Nick. Also welcome to the call, Nick. Yes, indeed. Uh, thank you. Uh, sorry, I just wanted to, get to come back on one thing, actually, to say, um, in terms of the opening remarks. Uh, actually, uh, I wanted to offer some reassurance. Uh, for us, the peer review is absolutely not an excuse. If I'm honest, there is a level of frustration at our end over how long it took to close that out. Having done so, we have put advice to ministers. I know that um, Andy has made his case as well, and I would expect them to respond to him shortly. So, thank, you, to hear, thank you. Thank you. That's a helpful contribution. Sorry, I mis mistitled you. Um, OK. We'll um, close that item there and move on to the monthly operating report. This is a standard reporting document for reference, so I'm not proposing to uh, do any more business on this unless, James, there's anybody with an urgent point. Uh, nothing relating to that, Chair. Thank you. Financial outturn 1920. Um, this is really alerting us for the July board the potential for carry forwards when we get the budget revision. Does anybody want to comment on this, James? No. Thank you very much, James. Well, those are three important items, NPR update, monthly operating report, financial outturn. But um, obviously, if you've got any further points, board members, feel free to contribute them offline. I'm now moving, therefore, to item 10, which is the proposal to end the public meeting at this point because of the confidential information or exempt information under the Local Government Act 1972. We do this um, by exception and only when it's absolutely necessary. Um, is the board in agreement that we should apply this exclusion for the final item of this meeting? 
James, is anybody asking to contribute? Uh, Councillor Mundry has his hand up, I believe that may be from a previous point. So, Councillor Mundry, do you wish to comment? It, it, was, it was on the, um, well, I put it was the MP, MPR, and I'll just be yeah. some concerns. Yeah, yeah. yeah we, had some, we had some concerns. I did put it in the, the message box there. I, I was quite happy for that to, to go forward. Just if it is about how Manchester Leeds is being treated compared to Liverpool to Manchester. Right. I think there's, there's a stark contrast between the two ways they're being looked at. And we're really concerned is that the, uh, the Liverpool to Manchester should have the same, uh, should be treated in the same way and, and the same importance put on that as well. Thank, thank you, Hans. And sorry we missed that earlier on. And thank you for putting it on the chat bar. And I'll ask Tim to follow up in writing to you or give you a bell. Thank you okay, very thank much. You. Thank you. So I'm going to take item 10, the ending of the public meeting, as agreed now, unless anybody speaks up to the contrary in the next few seconds. Thank you very much. Well, can I thank colleagues from the public for their interest in this meeting? We've not very much more to do today, um, but thank you for joining us thus far. And can I ask Kevin from the Home